start the recording right now. So um, this becomes available for you as an archive. And I will be sending you the link of this archived session in a couple of days. So welcome to the workshop Designing a Course Syllabus. My name is Janet Giesen, and I'm the Instructional Design Coordinator here in Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center at Northern Illinois University. I've added a few pictures of myself other than my formal portrait um, to show you what I do outside of work, which is actually proof that life does exist beyond the work week. Uh, the first one is of me in a, in a creek, um, taking garbage out of it. I'm an Illinois master naturalist and I like to help clean up the environment. The next image is of my two cats, Pushkin and Fuzzy. Uh, it's amazing that they're sitting together because they really don't get along too well. Uh, the next is me fishing up in Canada. Uh, my partner Ed and I love to go fishing when we have the time. And then this last image on the right is me in my garden a few years ago. Uh, when my uh, sunflower plants basically took over my garden. Um, but that is one of, my, one of my passions outside of uh, training faculty and TAs to do better with what they do um, is gardening. So we have a few general guidelines for today's workshop in that if you would like to ask a question, you can raise your hand. And at the bottom of your screen to the right of my little bubble image, you'll see a little uh, icon of a person with their hand raised. You can click that and then we can answer your question. Uh, please also turn on your microphone um, only when you are um, acknowledged to speak and then disable it when you are uh, done speaking just to avoid any ambient sounds that you might have in the background. I'm not sure if all of you can hear the bells ringing behind me, um, but these microphones are pretty sensitive and they do pick up all sorts of sounds. But you are welcome to ask questions at any time during the workshop using the chat feature, uh, which is a bubble at the bottom of your right hand screen. And you'll click the bubble and there'll be a chat window where you can actually say something. So again, welcome to the workshop. All right. So to get started and to nimble up your fingers, let's do a real quick icebreaker about something else. If you weren't attending today's workshop, what would you most likely be doing at this time? So share just a little bit about yourself, about what you might be doing in the chat area. OK, see we have people who are grading papers, working at the gym. Oh. Robin, can you bring some of those scones over to us? We'd love to have some. I see Bill's playing the piano, bicycling, working on a syllabus. Excellent, Christine. You get an A for the workshop. Super. OK, so we all could be doing something else, but I'm so glad that you're with us today. As with a course syllabus, having objectives keeps us focused and aware of where we're going in today's workshop. So hopefully by the end of this a brief time I have with you today, uh, you will be able to describe the purpose of a syllabus, um, identify uh, some of the major components that make up a syllabus. Um, then we'll talk briefly about creating a learner-centered syllabus, and that's something that a lot of us have not considered before. And then briefly talk about designing an aesthetically pleasing syllabus, something that looks a little bit beyond what we're used to actually seeing. So what we're going to do right now is think about the syllabus really as a roadmap that you and your students can follow as you navigate the course. And we navigate the course really throughout the semester. And we have a 16-week semester coming upon us um, in the ne next few weeks. So the syllabus then really is a, uh, a primary source of information to guide your students throughout the semester and really should carefully explain a lot of the course components that we're going to be discussing soon. 
So the syllabus acts as your teaching outline also for the semester. When I teach a course, I always keep my syllabus at hand so I can make notes on it, so I can use it as a reference document the next time I teach the class. And most likely your syllabus is going to be one of the first substantial means of communication between you and your students. Often you send the syllabus even before the class starts, so you're communicating to your students via the syllabus about what the course is going to be about. So the ultimate goal then of a well-designed syllabus um, basically is to ensure students understand what's expected of them throughout the semester, uh, and therefore you want to make sure it's easy to read, understand, and follow. So this slide kind of shows you how you could lay out the syllabus um, by week. Uh, you know, the first week you do introductions, review the syllabus, if you teach, let's say, a night class, or maybe the first day of the class, and so on. So you can lay it out in a roadmap fashion. Not only is your syllabus a roadmap that defines the structure of your course, it also serves a number of purposes. And I'm going to be covering each of these five purposes individually. So first off, the first purpose really is your syllabus is a planning document. It helps you plan your course. So most likely when you begin to, to put your syllabus together, you gather materials maybe from the last time you taught the course, or perhaps you have received um, documents from a colleague who taught the course, um, and then you have those materials to put together. So the notes and materials can help you develop an effective syllabus. Uh, also, using feedback that you might have gathered from students when you've taught the course can help in what you might include in the syllabus, maybe such as study tips, rubrics, um, and assignment topics. But no matter what you use uh, to plan the syllabus, make your syllabus your own, make it unique to you and your course. And we'll cover some of those points a little bit later in the workshop. Be sure that you align all of your course components, and again, we'll discuss that um, in a little bit as well. And then for students, you know, a syllabus is really going to help them plan their semester. It will help uh, them maybe manage their study time because you have a calendar and then they compare it to other courses that they're taking. They'll know exactly what to study for exams. Um, they'll know what to also include for assessments. So the syllabus is a planning guide. Also, the syllabus acts as a main reference communication device for your course, not only for you, but for your students to refer to throughout the semester. So you want to use your syllabus to provide details that students have maybe mentioned in previous semesters, such as specifics about an assignment, maybe where to get writing support, and so on. And then to create this device, this communication device, you want to be sure to use clear and precise language to reduce student misunderstandings and frustrations that might occur. But above all, be sure not to surprise students with an assignment or a quiz that has not been included on your syllabus. You want to make sure that everything you expect your students to do is clearly identified in that syllabus. The syllabus also acts as an agreement. Some people might say that the syllabus is actually a contract, um, but I don't think it's quite a legal document. But it does uh, convey a number of concepts that are of particular important, uh, importance to both you and your students. Students are often anxious to receive your syllabus because they look at it and they look at what the assessments are and how you grade, but the syllabus you know, includes all of your expectations for them and then your course, you know, what exactly what will be occurring during the semester. Your syllabus should clearly state any particular rules and policies and procedures for the course, um, maybe what kind of responsibilities you have as an instructor and what responsibilities students have as students. So I could include a statement such as, if I promise to come to class prepared with a well-organized and engaging lecture or demonstration or activity, I'd like you to do the same. Come to class prepared and engage with the class. Uh, are we in agreement with this? So you could include a statement like that. 
um, but you do want to lay out everything that is uh, required of your students throughout the semester. So that's how the student, how the syllabus then acts as um, an agreement. The fourth purpose of the course syllabus is that it functions as a teaching and learning tool. It can help explain the relevance and importance of content that you've selected to teach and then can also provide strategies for student success. And those strategies could include, let's say, hints for how to study, how to take notes, how to manage time, maybe resources such as tutoring opportunities, the NIU Writing Center, uh, and even counseling that's available. You know, you don't have to include just the bare minimum on a syllabus and adding a little bit more detail will show students that you are truly concerned and care about their success in, in your class. Um, in addition to providing basic contact information, your syllabus also describes or can describe how you can be available to help students succeed in your class. Perhaps maybe you could uh, develop some special review sessions for your students, um, maybe provide insight as a former student yourself, and so on. So then it becomes this teaching document. Uh, beyond the course description, then, a syllabus should help students become more effective learners in the course. And these items can greatly improve students' ability to learn the material. And as a learning tool for your students, they use it then to learn how to navigate through your course. They will see the course requirements and the policies. If you have a statement on what the students' responsibilities are, um, it, it definitely shows that you care about their success. Um, maybe you can include resources about ways to plan and self-manage their learning. A lot of students don't know how to do that. We, we should never expect that all of our students know how to be successful students. Um, and then as a learning tool for students, uh, the syllabus can act um, as a way to use campus resources. And it's useful to have, let's say, a folder for resources that students can access uh, for their success. The fifth purpose of a course syllabus is that it really becomes this permanent record of your course that has been taught on a particular, in a particular semester, in a particular year. This can help future students maybe who are searching for a course such as the one that you're teaching and maybe looking for a particular instructor. Um, it can also help future faculty um, and or TAs who might teach this course after you teach it um, and need the syllabus as a reference point. Course information then would include obviously everything that's part of the course that makes it up, the resources, the technology requirements, uh, the textbook and materials, and so on. And the syllabus really serves um, accountability and documentation functions. It contains information useful for evaluation of instructors, evaluation of courses and programs, um, can be useful in course equivalency transfer situations, uh, accreditation procedures, and articulation. So it does serve that permanent record and often departments or schools require faculty to provide a copy of their syllabus so it stays on file so it can be accessed by anybody. Now we're going to discuss the components of a course syllabus, the actual things that belong in the syllabus, you know, what information should be included. Um, it's a good time to refer now to the syllabus checklist that I sent to you. Uh, the slides in the presentation that you're going to see here will roughly follow the order of the syllabus components on that checklist. But this is also a good time to pause and um, ask if you have any questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat area and um, we can answer them. Okay, no questions so far. All right. Maureen, what is your opinion on subject to change? I'll discuss that in a minute, but it is something that you should put on the syllabus. Um, I typically locate that statement somewhere near the, the calendar. Um, but yes, a syllabus is subject to change and can change. Uh, one year I was teaching a course and we had bad weather, so we had to cancel a class. So that was perfect opportunity for um, subject to change. Um, 
However, there is a rule, a hard, it's a fast rule here at, on this campus that after the fourth week, if you make substantial changes to your syllabus, um, it can lead to great appeal. So I would recommend that you do not make substantial changes really at any time during the semester, unless it has something to do with um, illness of the instructor or weather related or some other crisis that, that might occur. But it's a good point to um, put on a syllabus somewhere that it is subject to change. My statement says something is subject to change even depending on how the course is progressing um, based on the student needs uh, of the class. Good point. All right, one of the first major components is that you need to know what are the components, what are the specific requirements, especially related to the department or school or college that you teach in. Some of, of those entities have specifics about grading um, and attendance and makeup work or, or whatever. Um, so as you begin to prepare your course syllabus, find out whether or not your department, school or college has policies um, that requires specific information to be included on your syllabus. Uh, so, you know, ask your chair, uh, ask someone of authority uh, on that particular um, situation. If you are preparing a syllabus for a course that has multiple sections, you also might want to double check to see what content, books, or other course components should be consistently provided across all the sections of that same course. Of course, you're going to be teaching uh, a multiple section course the way you want to teach it, and it'll be unique to you, um, but you do need to make sure that it does include all the components uh, that are required of other courses uh, in uh, other sections of that particular course. If you're teaching a course, let's say for the first time, you might want to review the approved course proposal that was originally established when the course came about to adequately represent maybe the course objectives and goals and content. However, related to that, some courses have been on the books for a long, long time and they tend to morph over the years. So you might want to double check that original course outline to see how well it actually matches uh, one that you're teaching to the first time it was ever established. Course information, or whatever you want to call it, um, but these are some of the basic nut, nuts and bolts of the course. So you would include on your syllabus a course designator and number, the section number, title, credit hours, classroom location, course day and days it meets, and so on. Anything that that's will help students be able to be successful in the class. Um, I pulled this from a course being taught this fall. It's a geography course, pro seminar. Often if you put this kind of information in some sort of a grid or a, a table format, it makes it easy for students to access, but be specific and make sure that the information is actually um, correct. I do always put in the original course description, um, but somewhere else in the syllabus, I usually put a course description kind of based on who I am and why a student would want to be taking my class. So I would make it a little more personal type of uh, course description rather than one that looks pretty um, uh, formal. Obviously, you will be putting information about yourself. So to provide further details, um, include everything that students need to know about who you are and where you're located. So your name, your title, your office location, uh, phone number, if you have a phone. I know that some departments have actually eliminated faculty phones because of the austerity program here on campus. Um, email address, office hours, and any other way that students could contact or interact with you. And those could be, let's say, a, we a personal website, a blog, maybe informal meetings that you set up in the library, uh, in a classroom, or any other location, maybe a learning center. And then if you're blessed to have a teaching assistant uh, to help you with your class, make sure that uh, their information is also included in the um, basic information about instructor and TA information, you know, where they're located, their office hours, and so on. Um, 
you can even encourage your TA to develop a little syllabus of their own. Um, so the TA, even though they are associated with you, it be they can become a little more autonomous and then have kind of an identity of their own uh, with, with their own type of, of syllabus. Um, what's really important too in this area, in addition to your email address, address, what is your policy for returning phone calls and emails, even assignments? Um, do you take phone calls over the weekend if students would happen to have maybe your home phone or your cell phone? Do you answer emails 24-7? Are you on the computer all that time? Do you answer emails on weekends? Um, so indicate somewhere on your syllabus you know, what that policy is. I usually indicate something to the fact that during the week I will answer your emails within 24 hours. If you send me an email on a weekend, most likely I will not be able to return it until the following business day. Um, but it is nice to, for students to know exactly how and when they can um, contact you. Although not an absolute necessity, I like to include somewhere on my syllabus the different methods I use when I teach a class. Even if you don't include them on the syllabus, you really should be selecting appropriate teaching methods and activities, assignments, and assessment strategies that you plan to use throughout the semester. And you do want to make sure that they reflect your course goals and learning objectives. Also, you want to consider ways to present course content in different ways so that you kind of match and address the different learning preferences that students may have, such as visual learners and hands-on learners and, and so on. Ideally, consider including in the syllabus a teaching philosophy that conveys your enthusiasm for teaching and your enthusiasm for your subject and also your respect for your students. You might want to include in that philosophy the importance and benefits of why students should take your course. Some students are taking your course maybe because it's a gen ed course and they have to take it. But in your philosophy that would be maybe customized for that particular course, you might want to explain what the student is actually going to benefit from taking that class. Um, adding this kind of a positive and optimistic teaching philosophy statement um, to your syllabus really can send an important message to your students of your true love for your subject, and hopefully you do have one, and that you are truly interested in their success in the class. Goals and objectives also should be somewhere located on your syllabus. They're often front loaded. They're somewhere near the front or the beginning of the, of the, um, the syllabus or the first couple pages. They really are your heart of your instruction and they should be carefully identified and written. And course goals and objectives represent exactly what the students should be able to do after successfully completing, let's say, a section or a module of the course, and also by the end of the class. Uh, objectives should be observable and measurable uh, and be stated in terms of student outcomes related to what you're expecting them to do. So do check your goals and objectives against what you actually do in your course. And if they don't match, this is the time to revise them. So you want to plan your activities and your assignments and outcomes that help students achieve those goals and, and objectives. So when planning these assignments and activities, you might want to consider listing them with the course goals and objectives um, so they show how they're actually um, aligned. I will show you how to do this a little bit later, but by showing relevance of your course requirements with related goals and objectives, students will have a better idea of why they're being assigned. So I'll show you this in a little bit. Course requirements, or we could call those outcomes, um, you want to list every single one of them. So list all of the assignments, all the readings, exams, describe the requirements for successful completion of these activities. Uh, you'll see an example of that a little bit later. Um, you also want to have a discussion with students early in their semester about class par classroom participation. Some students would consider classroom participation by just showing up in class and not saying something. 
um, but you might have another idea of what classroom participation is. So it's it's a nice idea to discuss this early in the uh, semester and then come up with a working definition so everybody has an idea of what is to be expected regarding this classroom expectations or classroom um, uh, participation expectations that you have and then you can post those to Blackboard. You also want to make sure that the timing and due dates are explicit and accurate, especially if you use Blackboard and you have your students submitting materials and you give them a, a deadline and a time. Uh, let's say you give them a deadline of Sunday at 11.59, uh, definitely add the p.m. or a.m. Uh, if you put 12 o'clock, they might not know that there's a difference between 12 o'clock noon and 12 o'clock midnight. So make sure that the students are very clear on what those expectations are of you. And then you might want to make available sample projects and assignments. And you could say that those are available um, in your office or you could make them available uh, electronically. But do also describe any associated labs, studios or recitations that help uh, complete the actual course. Course assessment. It tends to get a bad rap all the way around. Uh, no one likes to kind of give grades, so to speak, uh, although we know that students earn grades rather than we don't give them out. Um, but you do want to provide a list of standards and criteria for each graded course requirement, whether it's an assignment, an exam, uh, whether it's class participation, so then your students know what your expectations are. Uh, state how much each graded course activity will count uh, toward the final course grade. Uh, you might want to also include grading, uh, grading scale so students can keep track of their progress. Uh, there's nothing worse than not returning grades or not returning projects that are graded in a timely manner. Students should be aware of their progress at all times during the semester. You also want to state specifically how final grades will be determined and provide information such as whether you plan to weight letter grades, use accumulated points, or if you'll grade on a curve. Do state how students will be rewarded for effort and rubrics do help with this and then their progress and if you allow extra credit. If you do allow extra credit, how it will be used toward a final grade. Uh, some faculty have asked me, do I have to uh, allow extra credit? And the answer is no, you do not have to allow it for extra credit. Um, and I kind of give the reason is that in real life, we don't get extra credit really on things like taxes and paying our bills and, and that kind of thing. Also, do describe what incomplete grades means. Uh, some students take advantage of the ability to receive an incomplete grade just to give them some extra time to finish something. But an incomplete grade really should be given only in an extenuating circumstances. Um, but then also list any possible consequences for being granted an incomplete. Uh, so for example, um, if you are issued an incomplete, you will, no matter what you are, have you received as far as points for the class, uh, you will receive one letter grade deduction because of the incomplete and you can actually do that. Um, but do describe what an incomplete is and that it's not just something that happens automatically. Course resources, whether they're required and recommended uh, for textbooks, you might want to make sure that you provide a full citation and edition number for textbooks to make sure students receive the right one and other course resources. Uh, state where students can maybe purchase these. The bookstore is in one of the obvious places. Their cost, if it's known. Um, I, even on the radio lately, they've been talking about the extreme cost of textbooks, and now there are even free um, uh, open source books that are available, available for students uh, to reduce the cost of, of that. Uh, and if using ebooks or alternative sources is, is acceptable. Include any course-related websites uh, and Blackboard links if applicable, and if you have placed any resources on reserve in the library. Technology is often a part of most courses today, and let students know whether they need internet connection, whether or not they would use clickers, uh, you know, the personal response devices, 
if they need calculators or mobile devices or whatever they would need to be successful in your class, make sure you write that on the syllabus. And then also listing support services to help students be successful um, as students with their academics especially. Listing these services can convey a message to your students that you are truly interested in their success. So it's nice to provide the resources. Uh, you would put a link along with that, um, but uh, several of them are here, the Disability Resource Center, Counseling, Consultation Services, NIU Writing Center, and so on. And all these resources can help students become better students. Course policies. Well, this is an interesting one. We can all get caught up in this, what I call the course policy maze that can often send a message that our course is really all about rules and policies and less about teaching and learning. And although course policies are important, you might want to consider even how they are worded to make them work for both you and your students. And we'll talk about wording in a little bit. But do provide clear and succinct information on any policy that you have uh, included in your class, such as attendance or late arrivals, early departures, and so on. Um, you should also include Im information on using copyrighted materials, whether or not students can do work, group work individually or uh, as part of, of a, a group project, how they're graded, um, and, and so on. You also need to include some sort of a statement on classroom comportment, uh, such as mutual civility, being respectful in class, the use of cell phones with that image right there. Uh, that could be a whole workshop in itself. How do you get students not to use their cell phones? I kind of turn it around and say, how do we get students to use cell phones? That would be more from an academic standpoint rather than the personal standpoint. But you really, it's kind of difficult to stand there at the uh, doorway as the students walk in and say, okay, check your cell phones in this box and you'll get them back at the end of the semester. I think students wouldn't really appreciate that too much. So see if maybe you can figure a way of using cell phones in the class. Uh, whether or not students can drink or eat in a class, especially if you're teaching in a lab situation. Uh, you want to also list policies related to lab work, such as, let's say, safety, uh, human subjects, uh, respectfulness of human, uh, excuse me, but university, university property, uh, and so on. Finally, you might want to include a policy or at least a statement about religious observance absences, um, because that can be um, an issue depending on what students um, are enrolled in your class. The NIU campus welcomes all students and provides accommodations for all range, for a range of specific student needs. Um, the U.S. Department of Education and Higher Learning Commission requires that all courses have a syllabus uh, made available to students in each course by the first class meeting. At minimum, regarding student accommodations, all syllabi, at least on the NIU campus, must include the Americans with Disabilities Statement, um, which is available with this link here that I'm going to copy, and I'm going to put this in the chat area. But it is required on this campus. Um, there, the Disability Resource Center website is located um, here on campus, and I will make available all those links for you if you're interested. But these are the different areas and centers and statements that you might want to include some information about in your syllabus, just to make sure that we are meeting the needs of all of our students on this campus. Academic integrity. I recommend to faculty when they put a statement on their syllabus, instead of giving it a heading as academic dishonesty, do it more of a positive spin and say academic integrity and then discuss with your students what it means and how it will be enforced in your class. Uh, if you have policies, I would highly recommend that you adhere to them. Um, it's easier to pull back on policies than to add them as the semester has progressed. So in a separate and prominent location on the syllabus, do include this statement, uh, university plagiarism statement and conduct and discipline 
regulation statement and an academic uh, integrity statement. And there are all sorts of resources that are available online for those statements. And then finally, as far as components go, is your course calendar and schedule. And this is what students often turn to so they can get a clear picture of what is due and when. And it helps them plan their semester. So if you've planned to include uh, course information on a calendar like this, do provide the list of your topics, chapter readings, assignments, exams, and other requirements, and their due dates. You don't have to have a, a, a table that looks like this, but it does help to make it as detailed as possible so students know exactly what date, what's the topic, um, what is due, and when. Let's see, John, does it work to have two versions of the syllabus? That is a more contact, compact printed version. Yes, you can do that as long as students know that the more detailed version is available somewhere else. So if you are teaching, let's say, a face-to-face -face class and you um, maybe ask students to bring a copy of their printed uh, compact version and then say we can reference the online version a little bit later. But just make sure that if you do have two, that students know that there are indeed two. Um, because then if they don't go to the more detailed syllabus, they might be missing important information. But that's a good question, John. Um, do include or do realize that I mentioned with Maureen's question that the uh, syllabus is subject to change, and this would be a good place to put it somewhere on your course schedule. But there's, again, warning about this caveat, at least here at, at NIU, that changes after the fourth week of class can be basis for gr grade appeal. And that is a rule here on, on campus. But do review your course calendar and schedule very carefully with your students so they know exactly what's to be expected as the semester is progressing. We're next going to be talking about aligning course components. Um, are there any other questions we have so far on actually adding those components to your syllabus? I know we're covering a lot of information, and you do have that uh, syllabus checklist as kind of a guide to get you started. All right. One of the Let's see, Maureen, I was writing, did you answer John's question? Yes, I did, about if you have two syllabi, make sure students are indeed aware that two exist. All right, you're welcome, Zoe, about the checklist. Maureen, you needed some hyperlinks? We'll get back to you in a second, Maureen, so I'll start here. Um, one of the components of best practices in teaching states that your assessments uh, and your learning objectives and your instructional strategies should be closely aligned so that they reinforce one another. And you can see that based on this diagram that I have here. So to ensure that these three components of your course are aligned, what you should do is ask yourself the following questions. So related to your learning objectives, you want to ask, what do you want your students to know how to do when they leave the course? What do you want them to be able to do by the end of the course? Then you ask, what kinds of tasks will reveal whether the students have achieved these learning goals or these objectives that you have identified? And then you will ask, what kinds of activities in and out of the class will then reinforce my learning objectives and prepare students for assessments. So what I've basically done here is given you just a quick snapshot of uh, backward course design. And it's giving you a way to think holistically about how to see all the components of your course and how they should align together. Again, that's a whole other workshop. But I wanted you to realize that we have these three major components. We have learning objectives. We have the assessments and then we have instructional activities. And one feeds off of another. They all kind of feed off of each other, but they all should be in a complete alignment with one another to make your course successful and to make it fully aligned. 
as I mentioned earlier, um, here's how you can actually illustrate the alignment. Uh, this is related to a course that I taught this past spring, and these are actually three screen captures, the objectives, the module five quiz, and the module five discussion. And shows that how they, the, these components are aligned uh, to one another. So under the objectives, at the end of objective number one, in parentheses, I put CO3, and that's related to course objective three. Uh, the module five quiz, in parentheses, this would be related to module five uh, objective and then the course objective number three. So the, there were 5.1 part uh, uh, objectives in the module and, and so on. So you could show it like this. Students might not understand or appreciate it, but if you go through this in detail saying that the objectives is, are related to this course objective or the quiz, I should say, are related to the course objective, then they'll see that you're not just throwing things together willy-nilly, that you actually have a real plan about how things can actually be aligned. So aligning your course content and the assessments to, let's say, standards and goals is going to make it easier uh, to demonstrate how your course is actually meeting those standards and how the goals and course performance measures up to them. I mentioned that I was going to briefly discuss a learner-centered syllabus. And in essence, one of the easiest ways to create a learner-centered syllabus is through the language that you use in your syllabus. Consider using the pronouns you and I rather than the student and the instructor to help make the course or the syllabus more inviting. If you say the student will do this or the instructor will do that, it just sounds more kind of prescriptive and, and almost rule enforcing. But if you use, if you do this, I'll do that, it shows that it becomes a little more inviting. That way the syllabus then reads more like an invitation to learn and less like an edict or a contract. Other ways that you can make the learner centered um, syllabus is to kind of establish an inclusiveness that invites participation. So instead of saying, you will do this, I instead you could say for participation, I invite you to do this. Um, so establish that inclusiveness that invites students to participate, honors the diversity that you have in your class, and also welcomes differing points of view. Um, and then also making sure that you invite requests for disability accommodations. Uh, you do want to make sure that you do that so students aren't just sitting in the background hoping that you might invite them uh, to let them know that they need some sort of extra assistance. Um, also, making a learner-centered syllabus is to acquaint students with course logistics. So we've been explaining ways to do that. You know, How does the course actually function? Providing student learning uh, resources. How do students learn better? Maybe you could say, in the past, students haven't done well on this particular kind of area because it's maybe more difficult content. Here's how I can help you learn this a little bit better. You also can provide in your syllabus maybe warnings of potential pitfalls. As I mentioned in the past, let's say students haven't done well in this particular section or this particular concept is a little more tricky to understand. Um, here's how you can uh, work your way around that. And then also you can have uh, some information on how you stay on track. Again, don't assume students know how to be good students. And being good students is not why, what I'm meaning by getting A's in your class, but being good students as far as being punctual, participating in the class, knowing how to study for an exam, knowing how to even outline a paper or whatever. So providing all those types of um, bits of information can be very helpful and show the students that you're really concerned about their success. So far, uh, any questions up to this point in time? Because I'm going to be talking now about the visual appeal or the aesthetics of your course syllabus. I'm looking at the chat area now. I guess John had asked about some sort of hyperlinks. Maybe I didn't scroll up high enough about that. So John, did I answer your questions about those? Maureen says yes. Great. All right. 
any other questions before we move on to this final section? Okay. If you're using a syllabus that you've used for years and years and years, or semesters and semesters, maybe it's time for a makeover. Look at your syllabus and ask yourself, what does it say about you and your course? Is it strict? Is it rule enforcing? Does it look kind of blah? Is there a way that you could possibly change it up? Is there information that is redundant or that you could change or maybe reword to make it more inviting? Again, look at your course policies, maybe which ones are essential, and then maybe create a sub policy section that you could post into Blackboard that maybe would be secondary types of policies. Maybe you look at a lot of content that you've included and maybe it can be chunked or relocated within the syllabus. Often syllabi can be very long because faculty include all the information that they think is important for the class, which would include detailed instructions on how to do an assignment or the uh, rubrics that would be part of an assignment. A lot of the information that traditionally is on a uh, regular syllabus can be moved into Blackboard and to make it easier for um, access. So look at your course syllabus and ask yourself, is it inviting? Is it energizing? Is it exciting? Uh, is it typical? or lifeless or off-putting, and I'll show you how we can change this. And off-putting, I mean sometimes by the language that we use. And then ask yourself, you know, what is the required information? And again, at minimum, you have to have the syllabus for sure, and then you have to have statements about grading, you know, what the outcomes are, what assessments are going to be used, and then your ADA statement. Those course policies, again, how can they be less of a laundry list of don't do this or else? How can they be reworded to make them a little less intimidating? And then if you can reduce the number of pages, and I don't think too many faculty now print out syllabi and hand them out in class. Uh, I usually have my students print out a copy, bring it to the first class meeting, and then we discuss them in detail. Um, but there will be no reason now uh, through the use of Blackboard that you would have to print out a syllabus. The students can actually print them out um, themselves. But the overall aesthetics of your syllabus can really say a lot about who you are, how you organize your, your teaching. This is a, a screen capture of a syllabus that I taught back in 2011, uh, was a computers and education course. And I added an image of a computer on the front page. And I didn't add any other images, but I thought, you know, if it's about computers, why don't I put an image of a computer on it? And you notice also that there's a lot of white space within this front page. A lot of white space over here. You don't have to fill up your syllabus with text from the left margin all the way to the right margin. I also included in this syllabus, I made it in interactive because I knew that students would be accessing it online in Blackboard. So looking at this syllabus in an electronic format, let's say on a computer, a student could scroll over any of these particular main areas of my syllabus and click on it and it would take them directly to that section of the syllabus. I'm not going to show you how to do that in this workshop, but if you're interested, I can show you, um, we can come in uh, and talk about it in person, but it's a real simple technique to do that, but it makes the uh, navigating through the syllabus a lot easier. Um, so think again about maybe adding some imagery images uh, to your syllabus. And I don't mean just basic clip art for the sake of clip art, but put something that is definitely related to the topic of the subject that you're going to be teaching. Instead of completely filling the page with that dense text, again, think of the white space, use headings. Again, these could be links. Uh, make your descriptions explicit. Use bullet points, use numbers. Um, at the bottom of that syllabus, I also had some further links where the student could be at the bottom of a page and they can go to the top, they could log into Blackboard, you know, the NIU homepage and so on. So you can put these links anywhere within your syllabus. But do organize it in a way that makes it easy for students to access and find that information rather than trying to search out uh, through lots of detailed text um, 
you know, use lines to delineate areas, put maybe a box around text to highlight it, and, and so on. Use color. I have used color in this particular uh, section of that syllabus where I outlined all of the outcomes or the expectations of the course. I laid it out by exams and then projects. And I put dates and points and then I did a subtotal. And then at, in this particular course, I allowed students the option of taking a comprehensive final exam or they could do a comprehensive final project. Again, I was allowing students to make a selection on their final assessment. And they were both equal value. Um, surprisingly enough, students chose to take the final exam rather than do the project. But anyhow, but do use color. Uh, color is very useful. It's attractive. Um, it might not print in color. Uh, Maureen, do you have a sample syllabus with color? Yes, and I can send that to you um, a little bit later. But uh, feel free to use anything that I have here. Uh, for examples that you want to use in class. Now, if you have a student who is colorblind, they might not see these colors. So they're only useful in, in the respect that someone can actually see colors from in their true form. In your final check, and you should check your syllabus at the end, review it for clarity. Uh, review it for tone, and tone is what I mean is, is language. How do you set up the language in your syllabus to be inviting and to um, be less stringent and, and less demanding? Check for accuracy and typos. Again, if students find that you're not accurate with those dates, if you have typos, they're going to look at the syllabus as like, eh, they, she didn't really care about doing this. Why should I care about being in this class? And then also check dates. It's really important. Um, get a, a calendar that has accurate dates. Actually, I found a calendar not too long ago that didn't have 31 days in July, which I thought was kind of odd. Um, but do check any of your exams and your assignments against, let's say, holidays, university events. I uh, was teaching a Saturday class in the fall semester one year, and I decided not to have class on uh, that Saturday of homecoming. So I figured that students wouldn't be attending or they would hear homecoming activities in the background when we were meeting face to face. Um, but do be very careful about any dates that you assign and that they are um, very accurate. What you might want to do is um, ask a colleague or your department chair to check for accuracy and clarity. Uh, your chair might not be able to do it. Maybe even have a significant other uh, double check it. Uh, for meaning and whether the syllabus seems inviting or not. I do have some references that you will get this archived version of this slide presentation, so you'll be able to access these references. But there are three in particular that I wanted to call your attention to. Um, one um, is by Mary Bart, and it's called The Syllabus as a Classroom Management Tool. And it, it explains that, yes, you want to be able to manage your course, but you can do it in a nice way. Uh, another is um, by Howard here, a learner-centered approach to creating a syllabus. And then finally, uh, one of my favorites, and when I do my face-to-face -face syllabus workshop, I hand out this to um, people. But it's by, um, I forget her first name, Mary Weimer, I believe, from Faculty Focus. What does your syllabus say about you and your course? And that article really talks about tone, uh, how you can make your syllabus appealing and inviting and energizing and exciting for students to be in your class. So, you know, if it seems too stringent and too rule focused, it just might not really set the pace or set the tone for what's going to transpire through the remaining uh, weeks of the, of the semester. That is all I have for you today with this online workshop. It's the first time I've done it online, so it was a lot of information crammed into one hour. But this is my contact information. Faculty development is also um, 
that we do a lot of tweeting, especially when we have some of our staff members go to conferences. We also have a Facebook site. I'm glad that you attended today's workshop. If I didn't answer any of your questions, I will remain online for a few more minutes. And thanks for coming. Have a great rest of the semester, or actually summer. We don't have that many more weeks less before the semester starts. Actually, next week is August 1st. Pretty hard to believe. Um, but thanks for coming. Thanks for your questions. See you online and see you at another face-to-face -face workshop in the future.